Good evening, and welcome to another program presented to you by the Moore Science Temple of America. We are completing our series of the Moorish Wonders of the World. And today we do have guests, as always. We like to have guests on our programs. Today, these guests, these two guests we have uh, might be familiar to you. On my right, I have uh, Brother D. Robinson Bay. Welcome to the program. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. And again, uh, one face who you uh, probably recognize and know, our dearly beloved brother, uh, Brother P. Davis Hill. Welcome to the program once again. Thank you. It's always my pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have both of you here on this program. Uh, to our listening audience, um, these programs are very important because we get into the teachings of our founder and our leader, our prophet, the Prophet Noble Drew Ali. His teachings are so vast that it would probably take us, well, I, w I wouldn't even say how much time, but quite a bit of time to cover the teachings of the Prophet Noble Drew Ali. But here on this particular program today, we're going to get into one of the Moorish wonders of the world, and that wonder is the Bacterin Campbell, the two hump Campbell, which you see here before you. This Campbell is a burden, uh, is a beast of burden. Uh, we call him the, des the ship of the desert. And this Campbell is symbolic of many things that are very uh, close to the Moorish American Muslims. And we're going to talk about some of those things. We're going to talk about um, how he got into the Ten Houses of the Charter and what he actually represents to the Moorish American Muslims, being the burden, the beast of burden. Brother D. Robinson Bay, some of the physical features about this animal. Uh, uh, we know that you've done extensive research on this animal. Um, can you enlighten us on some of the physical features of this two-hump Campbell called the Bactrian Campbell? Well, I think you mentioned one of the obvious features, that being the uh, two humps. Uh, when you consider the fact that what's uh, widely known as the, the single-hump Camel, uh, the two humps um, is somewhat of a, an extra feature. Uh, I think that one of the reasons that our forefathers chose this particular animal or this particular camel was the fact that it did have two humps. Um, the hump itself is, is used to store food, uh, hydrolyze foods, where the camel can convert water. You know, the camel itself is widely known to be, as you said, a, a, a ship of the desert. And uh, one of the, the great attributes of the camel is its endurance in the desert. Um, it can outlast man uh, ten times, you know. It outlasts the, uh, the donkey or the ass four times. Um, the ability to endure, you know, the hard burning sands of the desert is, is one of the features that, that sticks out most forefront in my mind. I think you had mentioned to me once before that the camel was a cousin to the giraffe in terms of some of its physical features. Uh, uh, Excuse me, yeah, the giraffe, the llamas. The llamas, uh, okay. The domestic animals in Asia, as well as here in uh, North America, the deer. That's what I was going to, you know, trying to lead you into that particular area there, because when you think about the, uh, the giraffe, you think about Africa, when you think about the, uh, the llama, you think about South America, mm -hmm. and those cousins related to the camel. And most people, when they think about the one hump camel or the two hump camel, they think about anywhere where there's desert material, desert area at. Uh, but according to uh, your research and the research of many Moors, we, we come to the knowledge uh, and the understanding that North America is the home, the original home of the two-hump camel. Is that true, mm -hmm. brother? Yeah, another one of the distinct features of the, the two-hump camel or the Bactrian camel is that it is uh, more comfortable in colder climates. Um, you know, this camel itself, um, it's a widely known fact that it is a native of North America. Um, many of them were killed out in the 1800s. Uh, matter of fact, they, they were completely killed off in North America. It's an, an endangered species now. 
There are only about 2,000 left in Asia. Uh, but here in North America, it was widely uh, used for its meat, its tender meat, uh, as well as the milk. Uh, many of the European nations who inhabited um, North America at that time uh, used this animal as food mm -hmm. because it was so widely available. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just the bison or the buffalo uh, here. It was the two-hump camel here as well, the, the bacterium camel. Absolutely. This is his native land, North America. No, exactly. We speak of North America, Canada, what is known as the United States of America, and Mexico mm -hmm. as the home of the bacterium camel. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, one would never think of anything like that, P. Davis Hill. When we have, it seems like we have been indoctrinated to think that this uh, beast uh, uh, of the, uh, this ship of the desert, a uh, home was somewhere in Arabia, somewhere out of the reach of our people. That, you know, that has strong implications also. Uh, what, I, what it's saying is that not only if this Campbell's, this is his original home, but it says something about uh, uh, this being our original home as well. We as a people. Yes. Would you agree to that? I would agree. I would agree 100%. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, the, there's a lot of misinformation regarding the history of America uh, and the history of our people in America. Uh, it's not very widely known that America, the continent that's now called America and the continent that's now called Africa, it went where at one time connected. It's also uh, misunderstood as to how our people came to be in America. Of course, some of our people did come over during the slave trade, but there were large numbers of our people already living in America long before the Europeans arrived. In fact, long before the Europeans discovered that the earth was round, our people had been in, living in America for many, many generations. Uh, perhaps even millenniums, our people had already been here. And so our familiar familiarity with the bacterium camel goes back a long way. And it's um, uh, interesting how when the Prophet Noble Drew Ali put together our charter with the ten houses, the ten wonders of the world, he chose the bacterium camel to symbolize uh, that aspect of our, of our history. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. You know, when, when D. Robinson Bay was talking earlier about that we, our people, use the bacterium camel for its tender meat and for the milk, it's almost like the, uh, uh, the cow. You know, in other words, uh, our people depended on this camel to carry goods and to, uh, to feed them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very interesting. Now, today, um, you mentioned earlier that this bacterium camel can only be found in certain parts of the world. Uh, does that include North America from your research, too? Um, there are only uh, two in captivity in North America. Um, as I said, it's basically a, a wild animal now. It's not widely used in Asia at this time uh, domestically. But uh, it is an endangered species, as I, as I stated earlier. Uh, there are only about 2,000 left. Um, there was one point that Brother made that I wanted to piggyback on was the fact that we uh, have this misconception of the fact that our people were not here, uh, that many of us came over on slave ships, um, you know, how the story goes. But um, when you look at the fact that that animal they used, uh, that camel, as well as some of the pyramids, uh, some of the, the uh, art, that was left behind by our forefathers. Um, this is evidence that proves that we were here, you know, uh, long before the Europeans came to North America. And we, when we were here, we rode that camel. Oh yeah. We ate him, and we milked him, mm -hmm. and we looked the same way we look now, just like we look now. And some of uh, uh, the Europeans, when they came here, called our people, uh, uh, referred to us as the Nanticoke the Mohawks, the Mohicans, the Cherokees, and the Choctaws. We're the same people who rode this camel and used this camel for transportation and for food. Mm -hmm. 
And this candle at the same time represented something that's very dear to us in which we tried to portray, and that is endurance. And since we're on that, let's talk about the symbolism mm -hmm. of this candle. Mm -hmm. He symbolizes, as the brother P. Davis Hill said earlier in this program, he symbolizes endurance. Now, what's so important about endurance for our people that we have to have a camel, a factory and camel to symbolize this endurance? That is a, a characteristic. Endurance is a, a quality uh, of character uh, that we as Moorish Americans uh, hope to to emulate, uh, to internalize and make a part of our, of our existence. The, that camel, of course, he symbolizes endurance. He symbolizes the ability to bear uh, the heavy burden under adverse conditions. And I think that's something that all of us can identify with as, a, as being something highly desirable in our character. Um, it doesn't matter what the conditions may be, wind and rain and, and heat, um, we must move forward, we must continue to move forward, we must, we must persevere. And I can't think of any other animal, any other creature in nature that uh, exemplifies that more than that Bacterian camel. If we no take note of the Bacterian camel, we notice that he's He's not very uh, pleasant looking. Um, he has, he's a hairy beast with short legs, uh, with two humps, um, not a very pleasant looking face, and not a very pleasant disposition at times because he's single-minded in his purpose. His purpose is not so much to be pleasant because in bearing one's burden, it's not um, always possible to be pleasant and to have a kind word to say to someone. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the most important thing is to, is to carry the burden, to get to, to your eventual destination. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we most Americans, particularly here in the modern times, can identify with uh, quite readily. Of course, a, a racehorse, is, he's sleek and uh, he's shiny and he has long legs and he's and he's fast, but the uh, the race or the the prize is not so is not given to the one who who is fast and and fleet of foot and who looks good and who's pleasant. It is given to the one who endures under all ex uh, conditions, and we Moorish Americans uh, understand that and we've internalized that to the point where we regard the Bachman Camel as being one of the ten wonders of the world on our great Moorish Charter. Mm -hmm. Now that uh, endurance that the Moorish Americans have, as you said, uh, we uh, take the symbol of the camel, we try to endure. Would you not say that some of our forefathers who had to endure uh, um, adverse conditions uh, during the time of slavery absolutely portrayed these attributes of the camel? Of course they did. Um, they had to survive in order for us to, to be here. And for that reason, we hold our forefathers in high esteem. Um, there's a, in our teaching, in our doctrine, we're taught to honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the earth land which the Lord thy God, Allah, hath given thee. And we look back at the conditions under which our fathers existed, and we know that they had internalized this universal uh, quality of in endurance um, against all kinds of opposition. There's another uh, part of our doctrine that says that thought must be developed by the exercise of strength by striving against something, by striving against adverse conditions, by striving against the storms and, and other vicissitudes of fortune, mm -hmm. that by overcoming 
by testing oneself against those conditions and overcoming those conditions, uh, conditions it strengthens our mental muscle and our spiritual muscle. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, um, I think back on what he was saying. The fact that we're honoring our forefathers, we're proclaiming our nationality to the world. You know, this is considered to many to be a new idea. But in fact, we're returning uh, to the, the mind of our forefathers. You know, we're returning back to that state of mind. Uh, we're, we're telling the world that we're not black. We're telling where we're not Negro or colored or Ethiopian. You know, that takes endurance itself. You know, the world, you know, people tend to uh, take new ideas um, and, you know, add controversy to it or to oppose those new ideas. But we're not saying this is a new idea. You know, we're going back to the old time religion of our forefathers. Uh, we're honoring the creed and the principles of our forefathers. Um, this takes endurance in this day and age. We're a family oriented organization here in the Morris Science Temple of America. And we're perpetuating this um, from generation to generation. Uh, it's going to take a lot of endurance to, to tell uh, Asiatics in North America today that they are not black. You know, the prophet back in 1928 told us that, you know, in many of his letters. Um, this is going to take a lot of endurance because we get opposition more so from our own people than from other nationalities, the people who, are, who understand the importance of nationality. Uh, you know, the Italian-Americans, the uh, Greek-Americans, all of the groups of people who proclaim their nationality uh, need to help us in this, this great task mm -hmm. of uplifting our people by letting them know that they have a nationality as well. You know, that was unfortunately taken away from them in 1779. But, you know, this is a new era of time now, and all men must proclaim their free national name, mm -hmm. you know, to be recognized by this government in which we live, as well as the nations of the world. You speak about uh, us having to endure to proclaim our nationality. Let's go back a little bit to the days when our founder and leader, the Prophet Noble Ali, founded this movement. Did he have to experience, uh, did he have to endure? And if so, what did he endure according to your um, recollection of what occurred? We have to understand, Prophet Noble Ali was the first upon the scene to incorporate uh, religious, religious organization teaching Islam to his people here in North America. Um, we have to admit the fact that this government was, uh, this government of the United States of America has Christian um, idealisms behind it. So this was to many a new, a new concept here in North America. Um, the prophet had to face religious opposition from um, many priests or people who were a part of the establishment. Uh, he had to face opposition from his own people. Um, you know, I, I wish I could only convey what the prophet went through. I can, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. From what we read and understand, we know he endured a lot of uh, misunderstandings from what this movement was dedicated to. You know, there were those who, as you said, thought that this was something new mm -hmm. and thought that uh, this was uh, some fly-by-night type of organization that would be here in one week and gone the next week. Mm -hmm. So he, he uh, in addition to what you're saying, uh, uh, you just got through saying, sharing with us, he had to do all of that. And at the same time, he had to make sure that certain pieces were in place, that this organization was on a solid foundation. So he had to endure quite a bit, and, and, and therefore he represented a lot of attributes of that Campbell because he had to take it and he had to demonstrate the possibilities of things. Yes. I see you have some additions to that, and you're itching to say it, brother. Let's hear it. Yes, um, in those days in particular, and in, in, those, in these modern days too, it's not popular to say that we're not black. Why? It's, it's not popular because the generality of our people uh, regard themselves as being black, as custom. Mm -hmm. um, the generality of our people regard themselves as being Christians. Christian pretenders is what we like to refer to them as. But our position, our course, 
is a course that we are not going to change. But why are we not black? We're not black because black is one of those terms that was placed on slaves during the time of slavery, okay. which lasted from 1865, lasted from 1779, rather, until 1865, in which it was ab abolished by the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United Const States of America. Okay. Now, if the terms, if slavery itself was abolished by the Constitution, then is, it follows that all of those derogatory marks Negro, black, colored, that were placed upon slaves was also abolished. And to persist in, in 130 years after slavery has been abolished and calling oneself Negro, black, and colored uh, is just as unconstitutional um, now as it was then. And so we are not Negroes, colored folks, and black people. And that is unpopular to say to our people. Is it also unpopular they don't, to say that we're not Christians? Is it just as unpopular? They, they don't want to hear that. It doesn't sound good to them. It's a, they are not familiar with it. But being reminded of, of what, the, what the Campbell symbolizes, he doesn't care what the, condition, what the adverse conditions may be, what the adverse reaction may be. And if we notice the Campbell is, he's alone. And sometimes you have to take a position even if you take that position alone in the cause of right. And so it doesn't matter what others say. It doesn't matter if 99.9999% of our people call themselves black. We will tell them in no uncertain terms that they are wrong. And we will not change no matter what the consequences may be. At the same time, we'll tell them that they cannot be Christians. And again, 90% of them may regard themselves as being Christians. We would tell them again in no uncertain terms that no, they are not Christians because Christianity is for the European nations. It is not for our people. We have nothing derogatory to say about Christianity only to say that it belongs to the Europeans and not to our people. And taking those kinds of positions um, requires a, a certain resolution of character and that Campbell symbolizes uh, resolution it symbolizes that willingness and that ability to stand your ground uh, no matter what and uh, if you are right it doesn't matter if you stand alone because the universe is right and uh, the, the circumstances will converge in your favor so you're not looking for great numbers because right in and of itself is, is, is power. And so that's something that we're, uh, that we're not so much concerned about in how many of us it is, uh, what the generality of men have to say, because we know that the generality of men are ignorant. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking in that kind of flavor, and that certainly flavor, uh, I'm sure our audience uh, is enjoying, Jesus, stood alone in many issues and he exclaimed that he was right to the bitter end but he was alone and he endured do we have to be Christians to love Jesus absolutely not if I may brother Go right ahead. Um, you know here in the more science temple America we honor all divine prophets uh, Jesus Muhammad Buddha Confucius and other prophets of their day um, this Holy Quran of the Moorish Science Temple of America. Could you hold that up for oh, audience to see it? Please. Um, which is available at the Moorish Science Temple of America. Uh, I want, I want, excuse me one minute. I yeah. want the camera to get a shot of that Quran. Right. If you can hold one up All right. just for a moment. Can you see that audience? Okay. Okay. Yeah, but as I was stating, this small pamphlet here, uh, which truly has many truths in it, uh, states that these secret lessons, which the Muslims in uh, India, Egypt, and Palestine held back for many years, just was not available to the Muslims of America. Uh, these secret lessons are for all of those who love Jesus and desire to know more about his life, works, and teachings. Uh, in this uh, pamphlet, there are 18 years missing from the Holy Bible. 
from your holy bible um 18 years of what 18 years of his life work in teaching whose and, life uh, of jesus okay prophet jesus in uh, india europe and africa uh, so if you truly love jesus and you desire to know more about his life work and teachings in the more science temple of america is a place you need to be mm -hmm. true so in these 18 years of jesus life that's in this pamphlet called the Holy Quran of the Morris Steins Temple of America, we can read how he endured himself. Uh -huh. We can read for ourselves how he endured. Mm -hmm. Now that's interesting too because as a child growing up, I used to read the Bible, and still do sometimes, but I would read to the point where Jesus was 12 years old and I didn't hear anything else about him until 18 years later on. I used to wonder what happened during that space there those 18 years, what was he doing? What was he about? Where was he going? He was traveling about and completing his, his education in Africa, uh, Egypt. Um, contrary to what some people may think, Egypt is not in the Middle East. You know, some people attempt to take Egypt and place it in the Middle East as if it were not a part of Africa. But Jesus spent many years uh, studying in Africa along with uh, his mother Mary and along with uh, John uh, and Elizabeth. They spent many years studying and completing their course of uh, training in Africa. Amazing. Very good. Another, another story I would like to relate about about Jesus and this has probably more to do with the with that, with that character, that, that characteristic of being able and willing to stand alone. Jesus gave a, a magnificent sermon at one time, uh, and multitudes were there. And after Jesus finished saying what he had to say, because he didn't come to tell people uh, what they wanted to hear, it, it was not one of those feel-good talks. You know, you can, you can, people will agree with you if you're telling them all that feel good stuff where it makes them feel good on the inside mm -hmm. even if you're lying to them and they know you're lying to them but Jesus was not that kind of person he was one of those who was willing and able to stand alone and so he gave his sermon and his sermon upset and it probably offended many people and they said to him well you you are insane you, you speak as devil speak but Jesus didn't care uh, uh, he understood that uh, uh, that the generality of men were not just were not able they were not willing, they were not strong enough. What he was saying, um, if you were weak of mind and faint of heart, then you didn't want to hear what he had to say. And so after, they, after he finished his sermon, all of them left. They said he was a devil and this and that. But there was one out of the whole multitude, a, a seeker after truth, uh, a tiller of the soil, a generous soul out of the whole group that was there. And so that's the kind of, that's the kind of people that we are, I hope to be as Moorish Americans, and that's the kind of character that we hope to appeal to, those who are not weak of heart and, 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 and faint of mind. Um, that's what we're looking for, uh, to uplift the nation and take your place in the affairs of men. Be like that Bactrian camel uh, who does, doesn't always have the kind, flattering word to say to you because uh, the enemies gained by the truth are better than the friends obtained by flattery. If we have to flatter someone in order for them to be friendly toward us, in other words, if we have to lie to them or withhold the truth from them in order for them to like us, then uh, th that's not a sacrifice that we're willing to make. Okay. We'll tell them what they need to hear. We'll tell them the truth, uh, and we'll prepare for, for them being enemies or friends. Fantastic. That was a mouthful. We are going to take, at this point now, we're going to take a break, a short break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about the Bactrian Campbell once again. And this time when we come back to talk about this Campbell, we're going to talk about how we're going to rename him the name resolution yes, and what that what that means to the Moorish American Muslims. Right now we're gonna take a break. Stay with us.
we're back. We're back for uh, the continue our discussion on Moorish wonders of the world. This program, the beast of burden, the two hump battering Campbell. We're going to continually discuss this Campbell. And as we said before we took a short break, this Campbell represents resolution. But moreover, this Campbell to the Moorish Americans represents constancy. Constancy because he's constantly on it. He's focused. He's, he has direction. He knows where he's going. He knows that he has to, as he travels, he has to bear his burden in the heat of the day. There's a reward for being constant. There's a reward for being resolute, for being constant. What is that reward, Brother D. Robinson Bay? Uh, brother, there are numerous rewards for being uh, constant, for being um, someone who <clears throat> is straightforward, you know, not wishy-washy, you know, one day he's this and the next day he's that. People can depend on someone who's constant or, or resolute. You know, uh, be it in a business endeavor or just your character in general. Um, it's such honesty and righteousness as um, being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Uh, constancy is one of those virtues uh, that this uh, camel symbolizes because, you know, it's the, the ability to be able to endure certain things no matter what you know, whether it is, you know, one day, you know, if it, if storms come across you, you know, you're not shaken by, it. you know, um, it's that endurance that we spoke of earlier. You know, it's interesting too, because this Campbell, from what I can remember, you know, it's hard to get him started. I mean, he can lay on the sand for hours and hours and you can kick him and nudge him and say, hey, you know, you got this pack on your back. Let's move out, man. Let's go. And it's hard to get this beast started. Mm -hmm. But once he gets on his feet, mm -hmm. once he stands erect, once he takes that first step in the sand, or wherever he may be, he's off and he's on it. Mm -hmm. And as you said, if the storms war up against his shoulder, they cannot shake him. Mm -hmm. If a leopard throws herself across his path, it's in vain. What else? <laughs> what else could possibly happen to this Campbell? Well, he's, he's, uh, he's directed. He's not um, uh, wild and, mm -hmm. and, and subject to go off in any direction at any time. He, he has a course, and that course is, is fixed. It is locked in. Uninterrupted. Un in a, he has an uninterrupted course. And it's important to have, I mean, it's critical to have an uninterrupted course in, in life and what, what we're about. Because I'm sure that you would agree, I mean, and most people would agree, that if you, you can take the, uh, the, the finest ship that's ever been constructed and you can put it in the ocean, but don't give it any kind of direction. Any, no, any, don't give it any kind of direction. It'll twist and it'll turn whichever way the wind blows. But one thing is for certain, it will end up uh, shipwrecked on some shore somewhere Is that right? without direction. When it has direction, then uh, it, it can't be deterred by, by the storms and, and by the waves and, and by the winds and by uh, other kinds of misfortune. It's the same with the camel. When he takes on that burden, when he takes on that load, at that point, he is directed and come what may. Um, as the brother was saying, the storms may roar against his shoulders, but are not able to shake them. The, the thunder uh, bursteth over his head in vain. The lightning serveth but to show the glories of his countenance. Mm. Mm. And, and that's the way we are when we have a course, uh, when we are going somewhere. You know, we, we're not living our lives off the wall, whichever way the wind blows, that's the way we'll go. You know, our course is directed. And uh, we, we see it 
beyond the limits of the pole. We walk us up to it, uh, we enter it, and we remain there forever because we know that the greatest of humans is to be immutable in that which is right. Mm -hmm. To be immutable, you mean not to ever change. Mm -hmm. Like the inconstant, whose world is built like a, 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 a castle made out of sand, mm -hmm. where the swiftest wind can come and just blow it away. Right. That's right. Amazing. Mm -hmm. yes. And we as a people, we as Moorish American Muslims, we as a people have to have that kind of direction. We have to be that constant. That's right. We have to know that when we take upon responsibility, you can call it a burden if you want to, that we have direction, mm -hmm. that we're going to complete our journey. That's right. We there's, have a, it. there's a question that's posed to all of us Moorish Americans that says, how can his actions be right who hath no rule of his life? How can his actions be right who hath no rule of his life? A one who has no rule of his life, who has no direction, he wishy-washy. He doesn't take any position. Um, everything is everything. Everything is all right. One day, he love you. The next minute, he hate you. Uh, one hour, he is a god. The next, below a worm. One moment, he willeth. In another, he willeth not. Mm -hmm. And yet in another, he knoweth not whether he willeth or not. Oh. Because he hath no rule of his life. Mm -hmm. We Moorish Americans have, have accepted a rule of life. Mm -hmm. And what is that rule? As symbolized by that camera, we're going to fix our hearts on that which is right. Mm -hmm. And we fixed our hearts on that which is right. Mm -hmm. And we know that the greatest part of ourselves, even if it means giving up life itself, then we prepare to do that. Because right is right. And right is might. Right is might. Absolutely. Right is our law. Mm -hmm. yeah, and just as that Baxter Camel has direction, we as Moorish Americans have direction. Uh, in the MST of A, the way our illustrious prophet, Noble to Ali, set up the organization. MST of A? The Moorish Science Temple of America. Oh, okay. Um, you know, we have laws. We have rules, we have regulations. Even the principles by which uh, we, you know, our fundamental principles, those, those, those principles that are on our flag, uh, love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice, these are principles by which um, we uh, act on. You know, uh, we have established these principles. Um, when you become a member of the Morris Science Temple of America, you are read the laws of the organization. Those laws have not changed since the prophet uh, in uh, instilled. And what year was that? 1928. Mm -hmm. Year 1928. And so we have this direction in MST of A. He has um, made known to every member uh, their part, you know, and what they have to do in the organization. It's, it's very clear cut. Very clear cut. So this this char this uh, this virtue of constancy is something that you must have when you join the MST of A, mm -hmm. because we do have rules and regulations. True. And you must obey those rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. And when you join this movement, you have um, this organization, you have said to yourself that I will obey these laws. We need laws for our people. We need regulations, not only for our people, but it seems like there's an order when you have a group of people who have said to themselves and to each other that we're going to obey these rules and regulations because it's the right thing to do. It is good for us. It's good for our children to come and the generations to come. It keeps us in some type of order as opposed to uh, of, uh, of us being chaotic, loose, wild, mm -hmm. undirected, mm -hmm. no uh, rules, no direction. What they used to say, oh, oh, I don't want to say hog oh, wow, but mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. No direction. That's right. When you speak of, again, when we speak of uh, resolution and constancy, we have to also compare this organization called the Moorish Science Temple of America to those characteristics of the Baxter and Campbell as well. Mm -hmm. Because this organization of the Moorish Science Temple of America has truly endured since the year 1913 when this organization was founded. And it was founded to teach our people uh, that they must do the right thing 
and that uh, it is a benefit to proclaim your nationality and your divine creed and become a law-abiding citizen of the United States of America. This organization has endured. Yes, it has. You know, many misconceptions and misunderstandings as to what this movement was dedicated to. Our leader and our prophet, Noble Diwali, has communicated these things to us. Uh, is that not so? Yes, so. In 1913, when the Maury Science Temple of America was founded, when the prophet, Noble Diwali, began to teach our people their nationality and their divine creed, it was l less popular in those days to say that you were a Muslim than it is now. It was less popular. You were subject to receive um, more criticism and to be ostracized even more so in those days than even in the, in, than in the modern days. And if you said that you were not a Christian back in those days, uh, that was the, the equivalent of blasphemy, blasphemy in the minds of our people uh, in those days, even in these days, but not, not so much now as, as in those days. So for, uh, uh, for sure, the Maury Science Temple of America's 1913 has had to demonstrate that staying power, mm -hmm. that staying power, uh, that ability to continue to, to stand no matter what the criticism and no matter what the opposition may be. Because the position that we take is right. It is the right position. Uh, the prophet Noble Zhu Ali, he was mindful of the criticism and he responded to it. He said that the criticism was coming from those who had no ideas or who didn't have the courage enough to force attention to ideas. And further, he said that uh, the opposition had come from, from uh, certain Christian ministers who um, saw the propagation of Islamism among our people as being something new. And he reminded them that whatever the reason may be for that opposition, uh, the legal right, the legal right to oppose individuals and organizations alike for their religious belief does not exist in the United States of America. That the Constitution swings open for all and all may enter through it and worship as they see fit. And so um, the prophet and the, mem the early members of the Maury Science Temple of America, they were resolute. Mm. They were resolute. They took a position on that which is right. And um, they yeah. were like that tree that was planted by the water. They would not be moved. And they were not as articulate as we are in these modern days. They didn't have as much schooling as we have in these modern days. But they demonstrated something that we would be wise if we would adopt that um, uh, for ourselves, and that ability to stand for ourselves, to stand on our own, no matter what the cri criticism and opposition may be. And to stand for what is right. Stand for that which is right. And the way the prophet set up the organization as a religious corporation, you know, he filed an affidavit to that effect with the state of Illinois. And that there uh, is perpetual. You know, what he did is perpetual. So this endurance is a fact. It's a fact uh, just from the way that the prophet set us up. We're protected under the Second Amendment, under the First Amendment of the, of the United States of America. Of the so, Constitution. Of the Constitution of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very good. I know our listening audience is getting a, a mouthful and really enjoying this information that we're sharing with them, uh, this program, Moorish Wonders of the World, uh, Endurance to Bacteria and Campbell. How can we tell our people, or what is it that we can tell our people that would help them to do what is right and to show them how, that they, how they can endure as well, but endure in the Moorish Science Temple of America? How? Or what message could we give our people? Well, the first step, I encourage uh, those of you who are listening, uh, those of you who are just curious about what is this Moore Science Temple of America? What, is, what are these things that they're speaking of? I encourage you to come out. Come out and, and sit with us and, and hear us. Um, we have public meetings every Friday and Sunday at the Parkway Community Center, 500 East 67th Street. Um, just come out and hear the truth about your nationality and birthrights. Um, you know, we're, we're not forcing anyone to join us. Uh, what I do, as I said before, I encourage you to um, just listen, to sit and hear. And Are sure the meetings free? Oh, absolutely. They're free. There's no cost? No cost at all, no. 
And uh, basically we have public speakers uh, those nights and just sit in our audience and, and hear the truth. It, it comes from brothers like yourself. Thank and, you. Uh, Allah is great. Yeah, too. You know, I can remember the first time I attended a meeting of the Morris Science Temple of America. <laughs> And I saw some of these old elder people that Brother P. David Seale just got through mentioning. I saw them sitting around, and I thought to myself, how long have they been here? And when they stood up on the podium and began to speak and explain things to me about the camel, the lion and the lamb, about my nationality, about my divine creed, it was just a wealth of knowledge. I never dreamed or knew that this kind of information was available. And I became so thirsty to have more. It was like I was running a race, and I was, at the end of the race, I needed water. And I wasn't getting enough water to quench my thirst. Mm -hmm. and, to, and, and the more I stayed, the more I kept coming to hear more of, uh, of the teachings of this divine prophet, Nova Drali, the more I was drawn into the Morris Science Temple of America. And since 1978, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think I've been enduring and trust that Allah Almighty gives me strength to constantly endure and be constant in the Morris Science Temple of America, learning those things that are right and good for me and my family. Mm -hmm. It does have that effect on you. Uh, back in 1976, um, I thought I knew what was going on, especially as it related to our people. I knew about every organization that, it was, that was, was out there had ever been, that ever existed and been written about. I knew about most of the, of the people. And I'd read about them. I'd uh, seen them on TV, read the books and everything. But I had never heard of the Moe Science Temple of America. It just so occurred one day. I was, I was visiting my brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen him in a while. And we were sitting down talking. And he happened, in the course of the conversation, he happened to mention the Moe Science Temple of America and the Prophet Noble Drew Ali. I didn't pay very much attention to it at first. But he continued to talk. And the more he talked, the more intriguing it was. Mm -hmm. The more I was drawn into it. Because I, had, I was wondering how it could be, could this really be possible that the Maury Science Temple of America and all this wisdom and all this knowledge could have existed all this time without me knowing something about it. Mm. How could I have missed this? Because mm -hmm. I knew everything about what was going on with, with all the organizations. And I had never heard of the Maury Science Temple of America. When they said that was, that was embarrassing to me and that was intriguing to me. I said to him, I said, well, the next time you go to a meeting, I want to go with you. And I was feeling, I was on such a, such a high. I said, well, if I feel the same way I feel now when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to call him back and I'm going to demand that he takes me to the meeting with him. <laughs> and the next morning I woke up and I felt so, so alive. And I got him out of the bed early in the morning. And I said, you must take me to this meeting of the Morris Science Temple of America. Mm -hmm. He took me to the meeting of the Morris Science Temple of America that was over 18 years ago, and I'm still here. Wonderful. It has that kind of effect on me. It has that kind of effect. When you know, when you, have, when you have the opportunity to learn about yourself, because basically that's what the prophet Nova Drali teaches each and every one of us. He says, come and hear the truth. Learn about your nationality and your divine creed. Learn to love instead of hate. Learn of your forefathers' ancient and divine creed. When you have the opportunity to learn about yourself, it's overwhelming, especially if you're one of those people that P. David Seale spoke about earlier, a seeker after the truth. If you are a genuine seeker after the truth, then it's overwhelming to learn that this truth is inside of you all the time. And this truth is available to you through the Moore Science Temple of America. I like to use the story that I, that I often use sometimes on the podium, and then I'm going to, you know, see what, what you brothers have to add to that. And that is that uh, uh, play uh, uh, that uh, was called The Wiz, when the, uh, this young girl got lost in some strange land. And 
she came upon different characters who who wanted uh, certain things that they didn't have, like a heart and, and uh, uh, a brain and courage and so forth. And what she wanted was to get back home. She didn't want a brain or a heart or courage. She wanted to go back home. She wanted to get out of this strange land. And she thought that someone else had the power to get her out of this strange land and get her back home. When in essence, she found out during the end of this story that the power for her to get back home was within her all the time. Mm -hmm. All she had to do was to click her heels together three times and say, there's no place like home. Mm -hmm. There's no place like home. There is no place like home. <laughs> and she was home. Mm -hmm. When you know yourself, you always at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> True. I think one of the most prominent uh, instructions in our Holy Quran is to know thyself. You know, know thyself and thy father God alone. This is a personal journey. When you uh, take out your nationality card and become a member of the Moorish Science Temple of America, you have started yourself on a course of self-examination uh, to find out the gems that you hold within your heart. You know, as the uh, Brother Grant Sheik related to us earlier, the story um, about the tiller of the soil, you know, the generous soul that, that heard Jesus, that one person who heard Jesus out of the multitude, he was a tiller of the soil. He was someone who wanted to dig down deeper. Yes. You know, he was, he was used to tilling the soil. And that's what we're doing in the Morris Science Temple of America. We're, uh, we're not scannily, you know, uh, digging at the surface. We're, we're going within and finding the gems within ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. One statement that Prophet Noble Jurali made in his historical message to America, he said that the problems of life are largely social and economic. And of course, we, we, we know that's obvious. But in a profound sense, they are moral and spiritual. So that says to us that if we can, if each and every one of us takes that step and takes the responsibility to solve the spiritual and the moral problems within our own selves, you see, then these social and these economic problems will take care of themselves. Yes, of course. And so the brother is absolutely right. This is a personal journey for every individual, for, for, any, for, for all of us. All of us must take that personal journey sooner or later. It's like that old commercial that on television, pay me now or pay me later. Um, and so we have chosen uh, to take that step right now in this lifetime to get ourselves morally right to get ourselves spiritually right and by doing that we know that in due course that these other problems that we see these social and these economic problems uh, we know they're, they're going to fade away because the problems of life in a profound sense are moral and spiritual wonderful <laughs> listening audience friends and uh, sympathizers this brings our program to a close. We have enjoyed our hosts, as always, the most honorable brother P. Davis Seal <laughs> and the most honorable brother uh, D. Robinson Bay. We have enjoyed you immensely here. And for those out there in our audience who want to take this journey with us, as the bacterian Campbell has taken the journey across the hot burning sands, bearing his burden in the heat of the day, we welcome you. Take this journey with us as we take the journey with our prophet, Noble Drew Ali. Thank you, and we'll see you at our next program.